We want to recognize and honor the current tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet peoples who have been stewards of the land we live in throughout generations. We support their efforts for land and water protection and restoration and for cultural healing and recovery. Welcome everyone to our Earth Week series. Um, tonight, we have Jill Pelto with us. Thank you, Jill. Jill is an artist and a scientist who grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, and currently lives outside of Portland, Maine. Um, she completed her master's uh, in science in August of 2019, or 2018, sorry, at the University of Maine, studying the sensitivity of the Antarctic ice sheet to changes in our earth climate system. Jill sees nature as a work of art and the origin of her observation skills. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. I'm excited to be here today at the end of our Earth Week. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be sharing a presentation with you guys today. And so that's just gonna be about the work that I've been doing. Um, sorry about the light, I'm gonna move a little. Um, the work that I've been doing as I start my career and so I'm gonna first talk a little bit about the background I have in science and then um, share what I've gotten to do with that and um, then transition to, into um, how science and learning about climate change has really inspired my work or my artwork and um, tell you guys some of the stories behind some of my paintings. Okay, so I try to communicate science through my art. This is an example of one of my paintings in the background. And so um, this is just a little piece of that painting cropped, but it's supposed to be showing these salmon that are swimming across the page. And underneath the salmon is this um, jagged line, which is supposed to be a graph and show. And so that graph is of the salmon's population over time and showing it in increasing and decreasing over the years. And so I was trying to bring um, the visuals of my art to help tell the story of their population and what that data meant. So right now, um, as I start my career, I'm working as an artist and a science communicator. And so a photo on the left is me in my current art space. Right now, I just have a studio space in my home and I am living outside of Portland in Westbrook, Maine. Um, and I've just been there for um, about a year and a half. Um, and I had lived up um, in the Bangor area for a while when I was at UMaine before that. And then in the photo on the right, I'm in Washington state and I'm making a painting of the mountain in front of me. And this photo is from uh, um, a summer in August. And so I really love out there how, um, you know, you're still having that summer weather, it's still hot, that's why I'm in shorts and there's wildflowers around me, but you have these big snowy mountains too. Um, and there's just so much snow and ice in those places that it just lasts, you know, all, all year long like this. I also have a background in earth and climate science. So um, when I went to the University of Maine, first for my undergrad, I was doing um, a double major. And so I did one major in art. And then at the same time, I was doing a major in earth science and trying to figure out a way to combine those. And then I stayed on to do my master's of science as well. So on the top left, I'm in New Zealand and I'm taking a sample of that big boulder that I'm standing on. Um, in the top right, I'm in the Falkland Islands off the coast of um, South America and I'm measuring the depth of um, that soil. In the bottom left, I'm in Antarctica where I got to do my master's research. And then in the bottom right, I'm in um, Washington and so these are all places I just got to go um, through doing science. So um, through being at the university, and so they would all um, they'd all be things I would get funded to be able to do, and didn't you know have to pay to do this travel. So that just has felt so um, lucky and got getting to see these types of places in the world and learn about them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the research I've done in Washington because um, that research has especially really shaped me as a person and. Um, shaped my art. Um, so this is a photo me, of me in Washington this past um, summer in August 2020. I work with a research group out there 
And basically every single August, we go out and measure how mountain glaciers like the one behind me are changing as the climate warms. And so a lot of the mountains out there, especially the really big ones are covered in snow and ice. And that ice can be hundreds of feet thick. And um, basically we are just measuring how much that ice is melting and changing right now. Um, and so having just a continuous record of that every summer is really useful. And um, one of the key reasons why we work here is because um, in this area, the snow and ice on the mountains is really important water resource. So when it's melting in the summer, it really is um, melting down into streams that feed reservoirs for people's drinking, um, for hydropower, and um, of course, just for the ecosystem for um, species like salmon. And so um, it's really important to know how quickly these landscapes are going to change. Um, another example of um, kind of, of something I see working on Washington is um, a lot of forest fire activity, um, just um, as primarily as a result of climate change. I know it's something that happens naturally some too, um, but this is a photo of a mountain lake out there. And just from um, the morning of the, of the day on the left to later on that day, um, where it gets really hazy um, as fire smoke comes in. And um, I started working in Washington in 2009. And um, not until 2015 did I first start to experience like fire smoke. And now I've experienced it every single year. So it's just a very sudden shift where um, it seemed like there's just a lot more um, extreme heat and drought that's happening, allowing like really big fires to occur. And working in those conditions, even though I'm just there for a few weeks, it can be harsh, you know, to breathe in on your eyes. And so um, I have um, done some classroom visits sometimes with um, like virtually with students in, um, you know, California, Oregon, Washington, Western Canada, places like that. And um, the students have told me that like sometimes they have smoke days now um, where they have like school off for the day because um, just it, the the air quality is so bad. Um, so that's just been really impactful thing for me to experience also. And then um, this is a photo also from this past August and um, behind me is the very end of one of the glaciers that we work on. And this glacier extends um, miles out of sight so it's a lot bigger than it looks in this photo. And um, I am standing where that glacier used to end when I first started um, working here um, 10, uh, 12 years before. And so over those 12 years, the glacier has gotten a lot um, smaller. And I think that, I forget the exact amount, but it's a, it's a few hundred feet um, that the glacier has retreated. It would take me a while to walk up to where and is ending now longer than it looks like. And um, just besides the distance that, um, that it has retreated, just think about you know all of that ice thickness. So there's so much volume of ice that has to melt and be lost for it to get that much smaller. And so um, because I get to work in a place like this every year, which I love, but I just have, you know, uh, as a result, you know, I feel a strong a connection to this place and to, um, to these landscapes. And so um, seeing something like this for me is often very emotional because you just know you're never gonna get to see, you're never gonna get to see it like you once did and it's changed, you know, it, you know in, in my lifetime and, you know, any near future has changed for good. Um, and so that has often inspired uh, my artwork um, wanting to express that emotion. And then the last photo I wanted to share of Washington, um, this is Mount Baker, and um, it's one of the mountains that, that we, um, I work on with that research project. And so um, the entire mountain is covered in snow and ice, as you can see, this, this photo is taken in August, and um, it's just so, um, I just think it's so beautiful and like majestic and like kind of daunting looking a mountain. Um, it's a little bit under 11,000 feet. And um, if you look at that snow and ice, you can see all these kind of cracks um, running through it and those are crevasses. So um, if you're anywhere near those, you have to be, you know, navigate around them or 
or not go near them or, you know, be careful. Um, and so this is what a lot of mountains look like um, in, in places like Washington in the, in the North Cascade Range. And I think sometimes just reflecting upon this beauty, I, I think about, you know, how much different is this mountain going to look within my lifetime? And this, this mountain means a lot to me. Um, and to be clear, the glaciers on a really big mountain like this are not going to um, go away quickly, not go away within my lifetime, but um, they will get continue to get a lot smaller. And so they'll end higher up the mountain. And so it'll, it will look a lot different, you know, over the next hundred years and beyond. So as a scientist, um, I have really through field work like that in Washington, gotten to develop kind of scientific practices. So um, just being able to go out to places like the glaciers and ask questions like um, how quickly they're changing, how, you know, how can we measure this? So you try to find answers to those questions about the landscapes. Um, as a scientist, I've also um, just gained a background in the way our earth and climate system works, at least at you know, a fundamental level. And so just understanding you know, how we as humans are causing climate change now and how that's different than just kind of natural patterns of climate change that have you know, occurred throughout Earth's whole history. Um, as a scientist, I also um, have gotten to participate and learn it and, and learn about the way that um, we most often tend to communicate. And so um, I think the traditional ways that scientists communicate are through you know, giving scientific talks about their research. They give, um, they show posters at conferences, and then of course through you know publications with their data. Um, and there are a lot of scientists who are good, who are great at science communication and um, and sharing their work with kind of the broader public. But these are kind of the traditional ways that um, scientists should kind of share work like amongst one another more. So um, my skill sets of an artist as an artist um, definitely um, have overlapped in a lot of ways, but um, some of the ways that I've, I've developed them differently are to figure out how to really tell um, like a narrative in my work and how to incorporate um, complex topics into art. And you, you learn about that, of course, in art practice is in practicing, um, you know, having to make a piece about a particular topic. And then you also see examples of that in art history classes. Um, as an artist, I've also learned about how art can um, communicate. And so for me, that's, you know, through visuals, because I do kind of, I do visual art and I do 2D art. Um, and so by using composition, by including emotion into art, you can really um, use it to tell a story. And then in combining art and science, um, my goal is to pair that scientific information that I get to learn about, that I get to collect with the visuals of art and in doing so I'm hoping to make that story more clear to to bring a more emotional view of that climate change data um, and just share env environmental stories that people can relate to so again I think that um, but for my experience as a scientist when I'm working in those landscapes as I talked about I do feel that emotion but that's not what a scientist is going to be communicating in their and their um, you know, data or their posters, they're talking about just what's happening, you know, not necessarily how they kind of feel about it. And so that's where I think the art can really come in um, and be a great way to share those views with people. So um, some of my, I guess, initial ways of just combining art and science um, for a long time now has just been to paint landscapes when I get to do science research and kind of paint the scenes in front of me. And I've always thought that with art, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of patience and observation, and that really aligns with um, a lot of things I learn in science, where you're having to um, observe the landscape and really think critically about um, the questions you're asking about that landscape and how it's changing. And so I think those skills really pair well together. Um, this was a painting I made of um, this ice in front of me. So on a glacier, when ice is um, all broken up like this, it's called an ice fall. And those just form when the ice is flowing over 
um, like kind of cliff. And so got really broken up and jumbled as the ice has to flow over like a cliff that's underneath it. Um, and when I was making this painting, um, it initially started out as a day where the sky and the mountains can just be so blue. But then um, by the time I finished, you know, not even, I don't remember if it was an hour or, or so, it wasn't a super long painting. By the time I finished, um, it had like clouded up. Um, and so just getting to sit in these landscapes and kind of take this time to appreciate them is something I really enjoy that art, art can do for me. And then just two more examples um, of paintings I made just of kind of landscapes and, and science research. So um, on the left, this painting was um, working on glaciers in um, British Columbia and Canada. And so um, the figure with the red jacket is taking um, a core of the snow that he's on. And so um, we're not coring the glacier ice or anything, we were just coring the snow. And that was to look at um, what had happened that past winter. So you can see uh, different densities from storm layers and things in the snow. And then in the painting on the right, um, there's a girl scientist who is standing on glacial ice. And I love that um, glacial ice can often have kind of those really kind of aqua blues. Um, I guess it's you know just to do with the way that the light um, refracts through it, um, but I just think it's such beautiful colors. So I was trying to show that here, and the girl is standing at the edge of um, those um, crevasses that I was describing, where the, the ice is pulling apart in this crack. And so she um, is wearing. It's hard to tell here, but on her boots, she she is wearing crampons, um, which if you guys don't know are kind of like big micro spikes, so she can really you have these like kind of two inch spikes to secure herself on the ice. And she is lowering down a tool to measure that depth of that crack. And so um, just like kind of a wire with um, a, dro a heavy dropper at the end so she can tell when she hits the bottom. And um, so these are just examples of, again, kind of um, I'll make these sometimes when I'm at these places doing research or sometimes they're from photos when I get back that I'll paint. Um, and so these are my kind of first explorations into just kind of painting, you know, what I got to see doing this research and getting to share that with people as a result. And so now what I'm doing with my art is I'm incorporating graphs and data directly into it. Um, so this painting on the right is the very first uh, painting that I made where I had the idea to incorporate a graph. And this painting is about the um, glaciers that I get to work on in Washington. And so it's supposed to be kind of one of those kind of more broken up kind of ice fall things where um, there's a lot of different kind of um, patterns and textures going on in the ice, but it's a little bit abstracted. And so um, looking at that graph on the left, this is the, the graph I used. And so um, this graph is from the data that that research project I work with collect, has collected over time. And so first looking at the x-axis, the time period here is 1984 to 2014, so 30 years. And then on the y-axis is annual mass balance. And that annual, annual mass balance is just the budget of a glacier. So how much snow um, it gains in the winter uh, versus how much melt happens in the summer. So when there's more melt, then the budget is going to be negative. And so that graph line is just showing how over 30 years, there's this decline and decline kind of consistently in, um, the, in the glacier, um, glacier size. And so I use that graph then as again, like the profile of that glacier on the right. And um, on the lower portion of the glacier, I try to make it look, I mean, it's thinner, but I also try to make it look more brown and kind of gray and dirty because a lot of times as they're melting, there'll be a lot more kind of rocks and debris that's getting mixed into them. So they're a little bit less kind of, like, you know, pristine looking. I don't have as many of those beautiful blues that I love. Um, and I made this painting again in response to um, how impactful it has been for me to get to work in these landscapes and see them changing and wanting to share that um, when I made this painting, I was I was still a undergrad at the University of Maine, and so I wanted to share what I got to see in Washington with um, with those in Maine. So um, when I am making 
one of these paintings, my first step is usually to choose some sort of topic. And it, it can be sometimes like I'm just trying to find a topic and I'm looking, but more often it's just, you know, there's so many kind of ideas in my head and or I read, um, I read about something, I hear about something from someone and there's just so many environmental topics, you know, always kind of um, that, like at my attention that are easy to find. And so I'll just choose, choose a topic that I, um, you know, feel an emotion about and it's like a story I want to communicate. And so I shared um, getting to make that painting about the glacier where I got to, you know, be a part of that research. But more often, it's not research that I'm a part of at all. Um, it's just something that I've learned about. And so the painting on the left is about um, warming temperatures in the Gulf of Maine. And so that's a topic, you know, I know a bit about from living here, but it's not research that I've been involved in. And so then uh, my second step is to search for data, which can definitely be a tough part of the process. You have to keep your idea a bit general because you don't always know what data is going to be out there. Um, how easy is it to find if it, even if it is out there. And so it takes a bit of digging and something that I tried that I do now is I will try to um, contact um, by email usually um, some a scientist who is in that research field or um, to get help or if I'm um, or if I'm going to be using their data then I'll tell them and talk to them about it um, Jill, and so the yeah sorry, can I interrupt you just a moment here as as you're talking about the search for data yeah. I'm, I'm wondering have you used any satellite imagery to gauge the changes over the past few decades or is it all strictly um, numbers that you're working with um, to gauge the changes for the sea level to gauge the changes of the sea level from the that top view that you would get, I'm sure there's there's some amazing images of like um, Greenland that have just changed significantly. But I don't know how far back you would be able to access satellite imagery um, for something like that. Yeah, that's a good question. I um, I didn't do that for this process, but. Um, I know you can access satellite imagery quite a ways back, so that would be a cool idea. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure. So because this data isn't mine, I don't always find out like how, how do they collect the data, you know? And I don't know how they collected the data about ocean temperature. That'd be a good thing to find out um, because I trust, you know, their, their, their scientific process, um, but I don't always know the method behind, behind all of the research. Um, I know only, you know, the kind of research that I've been a part of. And so I'm not sure if they use satellites to collect that data or if they had instruments like directly in the ocean. Um, I guess this one is about warming. So I guess it must have been instruments in the ocean, but sea level itself, I think, is done um, with satellites, I believe. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, those are good, like, resources, like being able to look at satellite images, I know, um, is there are a lot of um, resources for that that are accessible, like free online, that can be really, um, really cool to look through, really, like you can learn a lot from looking through them. Um, and so this, this data um, is only um, 15 years of time, um, was it just in this research paper? And basically it's showing how the Gulf of Maine is warming. Um, but of course, as you can see, there's a lot of variability. And so, um, the researcher that I talked to about this painting, or sorry, about this um, data, basically told me that, yes, the, the Gulf of Maine is warming a lot, but his bigger concern is just how much more variability there is now, where there are these um, very abrupt temperature swings that are difficult um, for species to adapt to. And so it's that kind of combination with an overall background of warming um, that is concerning. And so I decided to focus my story on um, species that would be affected. And so um, when I kind of enter that phase of deciding, I have my data and I'm deciding my story, because I always feel like there's so many different directions you can go. Um, and so that's, I, I'll show you a little bit of my kind of sketching process in the next image, but I'll begin to think about what my focus is. And um, for, for this painting, I um, chose species and um, the fish are supposed to be cod, and so 
um, as they swim across the painting, they get lighter and lighter, kind of disappearing because they've also been really overfished. And I also chose um, shrimp and lobster and then in the sand, um, burrowing in our um, soft shell clams. And I also included the fishing boat because um, I wanted to have that kind of human element um, of something we are causing. And so it's because of us that the ocean is warming and to just kind of, you know, it's it's a tough thing because the fish fisheries are so important in Maine and anywhere coastal. Um, but if these species are being stressed by climate change that, you know, does need to be um, considered in fishing practices. And I'm no expert on that by any means, but it was kind of including a piece of that that story in there to think about. So um, this is, these are just some process images of making this piece. And so um, the little images on the top are just where um, I start any painting is with a lot of these um, tiny little sketches. Um, in art classes, we would always call them thumbnail sketches. And um, so they're usually like an inch or two long. And um, I do these for like two reasons. One is to um, just do that like first brainstorming phase when I'm trying to figure out what I want my painting to look like. And it's kind of like with anything where you don't initially have like a good idea necessarily. You have to really work at it. You have to pour creativity. And I think something that some people think with art is you just have ideas that kind of come to you, which doesn't really make sense because you know, who does that with anything? And of course it's going to happen, you know, sometimes, but mostly um, you have to do a lot of brainstorming. And um, then the other reason why this is useful is just to just figure out then, you know, how is this piece going to look like with its composition? And, you know, where am I gonna put the data and like making those types of decisions too. Um, but once I do have that um, idea that I'm happy with, I'll make my final detailed sketch, which is what's in the bottom left. Um, and then my method is to just paint right on top of that sketch. I don't erase it or anything. And um, I first started with the ocean and kind of went around the fish and then started to add more and more um, detail with, with layers. And then um, this, I wanted to share the painting that I made uh, for the cover of Time Magazine this past July, um, 2020. And of course, for me, that was um, a huge opportunity for my career. And um, it was a really fun project to get to do. And so um, basically, it, it was up to me what I, what I made this painting about. But, you know, of course, it was going to be about climate change, but how I focused it was up to me. Um, and I chose to have um, five different data lines in the painting. And so just from starting at the bottom, um, the first um, graph that I have is about um, sea level rise. And then above that, like the light blue area is supposed to be ice. And so that is showing the total um, decrease in land ice. And um, by land ice, I mean um, both the two ice sheets on Earth, um, Antarctica and Greenland, and then the ice that's on the mountain glaciers like I showed in Washington and um, Antarctica, there's ones in Europe and all over. And so it's all of that land ice declining. Um, and that that graph is showing from 1960 to today. And I didn't say, but the sea level is 1882 to today. Um, so then the, the area with the trees, it was supposed to be my kind of little like message of hope and action, which is something I'm trying to include in more of my work. And so um, that is about the total renewable energy consumption for the world. So just our, our use of renewable energy. And um, that data um, was also 1960 to present. Um, above that in yellow was um, the global average temperature from 1880 to today. And then last in gray, is um, the total consumption of carbon dioxide from um, 1882 to today. And the time was interested in me using that carbon dioxide graph because um, this was done last summer. So it wasn't the end of the year yet, but um, it, it seemed like our use of carbon dioxide last year was going to be down. And I think it was, I think I saw by 7% or so. Um, because of COVID. And 
I haven't looked up exactly why besides I know transportation is definitely a big thing like cars and planes, but I'm sure there's some other causes of it to decrease. And I know that it will continue to go up this year, or I assume it will, but I, th I thought it was really powerful to see that slight like decrease because um, it just showed me or made me think about how, you know, if we were to act worldwide, um, we could really quickly make um, this, we could really quickly make a change in the amount of fossil fuels we're um, putting out into the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, it's kind of this kind of um, stack of data that kind of looks a little bit like a landscape. And um, Ty made this animation to just show the data by itself first, and then how uh, my images added to it. And they had on the cover, like the little um, caption for what the data was about, which um, I thought was good because I do want people to know. And I, I don't think that people would know, you know, just looking at this painting, what the data, what the data is. And that's part of the point of art too. It's not supposed to be, you know, a figure in a textbook. And I don't want my work to be like an infographic, you know, there's that kind of difference. Um, so the last um, artwork that I wanted to share is what I'm currently working on. And so um, something that I'm doing right now is, um, finding collaborations with science research teams and um, science teams when they when they do um, research like um, like I got to do in grad school for Antarctica, I said that was funded and science work is often funded by grants, big grants that they apply for. And in those grants, there's usually a portion where they have to, um, they have to include some sort of kind of impact that their work is going to have because um, it being for science sake is great, but what's the impact on you know people and communities? Um, and so um, I have been starting to work on scientists on those grants where I can get you know funded like a commission um, to make art. And so I'm working with a research group who studies um, trees and how trees um, sometimes change have kind of I guess change where they live kind of latitudinally as the climate changes. Um, so just basically um, trees having to shift, you know, if the climate warms, they may be able to be higher in mountains than they are now, for example. Um, and so this group is actually based um, in Scandinavia. And um, so the painting on the left was the first painting I made for them. And that was supposed to be two women scientists and they are supposed to be standing on a frozen um, lake. And so it's that layer of ice that they're on. And then you can see all of that water underneath them. And this was supposed to be a frozen lake in Norway. And then um, at the bottom, you can see there's that long um, straight line that they're, um, that's going through the ice and the water. And that's supposed to be um, what they are um, drilling through the ice and then putting through the water to get to the bottom and the sediment. And so what they're doing is taking a core of the sediment at the bottom but in order to get there, they have to go you know, all the way through the water. Um, but it's easier sometimes to do this on frozen lake ice than um, to go out on a boat and try to keep that line steady in the summer. Um, and so then the second painting is on the right. And um, this was um, to zoom in on what it looks like to get, to get a core of sediment. And so they can also take cores from a place like, um, like a bog. And so now you can see kind of like a cross section of the soil. And um, you can see all the different layers of um, different colors of the soil that they're collecting. And so they will we'll end up having this kind of perfect cylinder of soil with all of those layers perfectly preserved in it. And they can take a lot of those, um, those cores. And so then um, the third painting is here on the left and that is now um, taking that core and extending all the layers out so you can see what they find in it. And this group is looking for seeds and pollen from um, different plant species. Um, and so, you know, when something um, dies or just over time as pollen and seeds spread, it will just, just get preserved in soil and it will get buried over time. And so you can find these really old, um, ancient like seeds and pollen and they can find out, you know, what type of species they're from and how old they are and find out how these species kind of have traveled um, geographically over time. And so then 
The painting on the right is trying to show that geographical travel and the particular focus here was the species of tree called the Norway spruce. And so um, the Norway spruce traveled around Scandinavia um, after the last ice age. So um, this, that was like about 18,000 years ago. Um, and so the map here of Scandinavia is supposed to be color coded with, um, but kind of by time. And you'll see all those little like shapes on the map. And those are supposed to be just like data points, but instead of just making them circles, I made them the pollen, how the pollen looks of the Norway spruce. And so the yellow, it, the brightest yellow is like, is today. So like modern Norway spruce. But then as you get to the green of the map, you're going back further in time and the blue is further and further back until that very dark, dark blue um, in the bottom right of the map is 10,000 years ago. And so basically in the bottom right, the Norway spruce um, was in that part of Scandinavia 10,000 years ago. And after the ice melted, it got warmer and it was able to travel all around kind of that archipelago and um, to where it is today. And so it's kind of the story of um, trees shifting with the climate and a big piece of why they do that research is to understand how they're going to continue to shift today. So these are those four paintings together. And I really have fun doing work like this, but you know, for someone, uh, this is not my research field and I've had to learn a lot about this topic to do it. And I, I think that unlike some of the other paintings that I've showed you guys, these ones are still, they're still a bit dense, like unless you, I will have a caption about them, but they're still, they're still a kind of a complicated topic. And so I love doing collaborations like this, but I wanna make sure I, you know, I also do a lot of, you know, science art that, um, that you don't have to like kind of read a lot to understand, I guess. Um, and the last painting that I'm going to make for them, this is like a really simple sketch of it on the right. Um, but they sent me this figure on the left and it's just about how um, tree lines shift with climate. And so when it's warmer, approximately like trees can be higher up on the mountain. When it's um, colder, they aren't gonna be able to be as high. And so I wanted to have, again, that like modern reason why this climate, why this um, research matters. And that's because of climate change and we want to know what, you know, trees are gonna be able to do. So um, when I'm doing these sorts of collaborations, um, I had this, um, the researcher I was working with, she sent me a bunch of um, photos. And so that's really helpful in um, just figuring out what, how I want things to look. And so I'll kind of make these, this is a, like, this is just what I have directly to work from as I'm painting. I'll make these kind of just collages in my computer of images. And I can look back at them for colors and how the tree should look and all that. And then these are all the images that she sent me of um, the pollen and the seeds that get preserved in the sediment um, and the, the views of them underneath the microscope. And then on the right was just like an example of kind of the feedback I would get from her about stuff. She would send me these kind of sketches to, you know, help me learn about stuff and describe stuff and think about how I might like depict it in my art. And so it's been a really fun collaboration and I'm almost done. Um, so I, I think that something I bet I want to convey is just that there's all these different great ways, you know, we can communicate important topics. And I'm, I'm talking about science and climate change, but I think that's true for anything. And so like, so there's some different examples, like in the top left, um, you know, we have, of course, websites that, um, you know, uh, this is the website for the um, research project I work with in Washington. And on that, you can find all these different sources like the, the scientific papers or publications that are written. You can read more kind of general audience information on the glaciers, look at photos. Um, and so to the right of that, like we take lots of photographs of the research that we do to show people what it looks like. And to the right of that is one of my kind of landscape paintings of that research. Again, just like different views to show, to show people and kind of capture what we do. Um, in the bottom left is a screenshot of one of the science papers that um, that has been written um, from the project. So that's going to be a lot more, um, you know, figures and um, kind of like 
scientific language, a little bit dense. And then um, to the right of that is the, again, the data that the project has collected. And then, and then again, my, my data painting. And so um, just all these different forms that, you know, I think just different ones um, communicate better to different people. And so I think that's really cool. And um, something that I have been really doing a lot of over the, just the past couple of years is working with students. And um, I have been doing um, data art activities with um, K through 12. I've done it, I guess, I don't know if I've done K, but I, I've definitely done first grade um, and through high school. And so um, kind of students um, combine, you know, math and science with, with art and stories like this. And um, I think it's a great way for them to express environmental topics that, you know, they've learned about or they um, care about and they can find a way to communicate that on their own. And so I just included some examples there on the right too of um, some of the really cool work. And I've been really inspired by that. And um, I know, you know, tons of, um, tons of, tons of um, people who are, are adults who are, you know, really, have been act have been active in um, environmentalism for a really long time, but I think the percentage of adults who are is still, um, you know, not as high as it should be. And so it's really inspiring for me to see how high the percentage is for um, for kids right now of how much they care and understand about climate change, and that gives me a lot of gives me a lot of hope as well. And then so just a few more examples. I was really impressed with this class because it was fifth grade and I also just was like oh they all seem to actually be really good at art I was pretty blown away with this there was more than this too but um really clear to me in these images that they were concerned they felt emotions and understood these topics and um I actually this um this week I just um I was working kind of more intensely with two schools and um Basically, yeah, I did, like, usually I don't do that many um, classes, but um, I was working with, with those two schools. And so I did about um, kind of 20 different, like, Zoom visits this week, which was a lot. And um, it was really fun to just, like, kind of get to, like, do that with students for Earth Week and really talk to them about climate change. Um, and then lastly, again, I'm just working with different organizations and um, of course that's a way to, you know, show my work and try to be, you know, successful as an artist, but it's also a really fun way for me to um, have my work different places and communicate about climate change in these different places. Um, and so on the left, I um, had my work on skis and um, this is actually a company based out in, in Carabasset Valley near Sugarloaf Mountain and it's called um, Northeast Ski Company, if anyone's interested. And um, the data on the skis is all about changes happening um, here in Maine. And then to the right of that is a book about um, glaciers. And so my dad wrote that book, he studies glaciers. And that's not something I spoke to, but a big part of why um, clearly I got involved with working on glaciers and built those landscapes. And um, the Wild Cascades is just um, a kind of conservation journal um, in Washington. And so it was cool to put my um, salmon painting on that because um, salmon are really important in, in that region. And um, they really need um, cold water and high water levels to do well. And so they need the glaciers basically. And um, then last, again, my, my cover from, from time. And um, so I guess the, the final takeaways I wanted to um, convey before I talk to you guys is just um, like first, again, like I just think that different media can really, you know, communicate things differently to people. And so um, I've, I try to consider that and just learn about like, what are those kind of loose boundaries of, of different media and, you know, what audiences um, kind of respond to different things. And I think that um, art is one of those, you know, really powerful ways to um, connect with people about important topics. And I think that's something that, you know, I certainly saw um, in art classes and art history classes, but, you know, kind of think on more today. 
And I think just one of those reasons is because art can really tell stories in ways that are emotional. Um, so I guess my goal as I, um, as I go further through my career is to use my work to communicate climate change, of course, but also um, to encourage people to take action. And I think that has to, I'll have to think about ways I can do that. Um, one goal of mine is, as I quickly mentioned, to have more kind of messages um, of kind of hope and kind of collective action and that power in, in my paintings and make sure that I have data that, that shows good, good changes as well. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. And um, yeah, I look forward to talking with you now. Okay. Thank you so much, Jill. That was fantastic. So inspiring. I love the work that you do. And there's, um, I feel like I just think about education in general and how wonderful it would be to integrate this kind of work that you're doing in the school systems more. Um, can you just share maybe a little bit about how, how you're already doing that? Yeah, so um, I have kind of, I've designed, I helped design kind of a curriculum or not really curriculum, more of an activity that um, teachers can do, but I feel like it can really be adapted for different age groups, like for younger, for younger age groups, I can like bring in some graphs for them and just have like a few options for them ready. And um, they could be global topics, but sometimes I'll try to do like local things that maybe they've experienced and have a mix of like kind of good and bad changes. Um, and then for older age groups, like they could maybe choose their own data more. And um, if teachers wanted to even make it more of a project, they could try to collect their own data and make art about it. Um, and so I think it's like such a flexible activity. And what I've been doing is um, just working with schools. If it's like a presentation or a, just a few, a, like a yeah, presentation or two, I'll um, just like volunteer my time. But if it's more kind of a full um, work with the school system, of course, like um, that will be more intensive for me. And so I'll ha like ask for funding for something like that. Um, but I really enjoy doing that. And um, so what I'll do is I'll like I'll present um, like a shorter version a shorter version of what I showed you and just kind of talk to them about storytelling and about climate change and then um, turn it over to them and like let them tell you know their stories and um, and sometimes I am just presenting and then that's kind of my only role um, I think it'll be easier after um, after things are are better from COVID to like go into classes more again and um, work with students because then I can like be there to talk them through, you know, activities and help them think about what they want to make um, art about and things. But I would say I'm like kind of just coming in as a guest and then their teachers are really the ones, you know, doing the hard work and like walking them through the whole activity once I'm once I'm gone from from Zoom. If we can segue on that, um, you had mentioned something about collaboration opportunities and I was wondering if you had any information or you have any um, activities that you're doing right now where students or research fellows or anyone can get involved um, locally? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not right now. I, um, I'm just wrapping up that one art project that I show, showed you guys. And then I guess the school stuff I've been doing has just been you know, piecemeal, it's like when, when a school contacts me and I'll set up in advance, you know, a time to meet with them, but I don't have kind of something that is just kind of open. Besides that, I mean, I guess I, you know, I schedule visits with schools and like kind of keep that just gen generally open. Um, but yeah, I like that idea of that though. I am foreseeing a painting class at Central Hall Commons. I don't know if I'm alone in oh. that. <laughs> cool. So we just want to open it up now to, um, to everyone. So if anybody has questions or comments, I want to invite you to unmute yourself and, and jump right in or raise your hand and we'll call on you, whatever you're most comfortable with.
Well, we have a first grade teacher, I mean, a first grader <laughs> here from Longfellow. And uh, we're wondering if she would be interested in, um, if we could arrange it to speak to the children in the first grade at Longfellow. Oh, she just disappeared, but uh, <laughs> we, wanted to, we wanted to ask her that. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, I am, I've been open for doing visits still. Um, would it be helpful to just give you my email and to set it so it can be set up with um, the teacher or teachers? Yes, um, it would be very helpful. I'll just put my email um, in the chat if that sounds good. Okay, thank you. And Willow, thanks you too. Yeah, thank you guys. Yes, okay, yes. I put it in there. So we've also linked the uh, the Northeast Ski Company if anybody wants to see the the work on on skis as well as Jill your your website maybe you could tell us a little bit about what people could find there as well. Yeah, so on my website I have I guess I have my gallery page and that just has all my paintings and when you click on any of the kind of little images of my paintings um, I'll have a description of what they're about. And I'll also have links to the data that I use so that people really know clearly where that came from. Um, and then I also have an outreach page. And on that, I have information about the stuff I do with schools, including some links to activities and some examples of student work. Um, and yeah, I have, you know, an about me page, a contact page, just to, you know, get in touch with me. If you kind of don't remember this email, you can find it there. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Other thoughts, comments, questions for Jill while we have her? Carol, yes. go ahead. I have a question for Jill. Um, of all the places that you have been to work and collaborate, did you have a favorite? I think I know the answer to this, but I'm asking you anyway. Oh, yeah, wait, what do you think it is? I'm just curious. I think it's at Glacier out in Washington. Oh, yeah, it is. It is, yeah. Um, I really like working in Washington because, um, like I showed, you kind of get, you know, you get to be up in these really beautiful, mount, like like snowy mountains. And I, I love, I'm, I'm a winter person and I, I, I was very disappointed in our winter this year in Maine. Um, and I love that landscape. Like, and I love that you can have again, like wildflowers and wildlife and the mountain streams and all of that. So as much as I thought it was like amazing to work in a place like Antarctica, um, you you don't have like that life and that color. And I like that in rainforest, you have those rainforests as well in Washington. So it just seems like such a kind of thriving um, ecosystem. and. Um, I love Maine, but it's just, it's different than what I've experienced. I grew up in Massachusetts, so very similar to here. And I think that's part of why it's just such a, a cool change, but it's like a lot of similarities to here as well. Um, I just want to mention my, my younger daughter spent a year in Juneau, Alaska, where she was um, studying what was growing back as the glacier uh, retreated. So that was her research project. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I haven't been to I haven't been to Alaska and I would love to. And I know um, I know people have worked in Juneau too. It seems like a lot of um, cool research is done there. That's so neat. Thank you. And I love your art. Thank you so much. Yeah, that actually, Carol, that brings up um, a question for me with the the pollen and the seeds that are being found that are I'm, I'm guessing kind of in a hibernating um, situation, how that's going to affect, you know, I, are they still viable? Will they still grow? Will the, the pollen still affect my allergies? Have, yeah. have you done any of the, the background research into any of that? Yeah, I, I think the pollen wouldn't be viable. I'm not positive. I don't know for sure. I just don't think so. But the seeds, I think that they sometimes can be. I think a lot of times things so pretty like, you know, broken up and not whole anymore. So they wouldn't. But 
I think sometimes when um, when glaciers do pull back from where they used to be, there's kind of like almost these like I think it's sometimes more like root systems of trees and things that can sometimes not have completely died. They've just kind of been dormant. I'm not positive about seeds, but it kind of makes sense to me like that they could be preserved. I'm not sure if seeds like like just thinking about like here over the winter, like I don't even know like do the acorns like die are they not viable anymore are they still viable you know I don't know that's a cool question though to think about so before before we close um I want to ask if anybody else has um additional questions or if our, our resident science teacher wanted to to put any um thoughts into that <laughs> seed question Oh, well, I'm pretty sure that um, the seeds probably blew in, you know, they were more new. Anything buried under a glacier for so long would not really be viable anymore. But um, be interesting to see, well, you know how it is, life is persistent. So when there's any bare space that's open, something's going to find a way to grow there. You know, I was thinking about your ideas and how you take data and turn it into art. And I was thinking about um, genetics, which is an area that I'm really interested in, and how you could take a multiple gene trait and really um, graph them and make some, some pretty interesting art with that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not, I've of course like made more like science art about topics kind of on the periphery of what I do. And so that is not on the periphery of what I do. And so I wouldn't have, like, it hasn't crossed my path. So it's really cool to think about, you know, what are some other kind of forms of science like that? But yeah, I would love to learn more about that. Tara, you have your hand raised? I do, <laughs> just because it's fun to use these little emojis, <laughs> especially. Um, so Jill, I was actually just wondering about some of the medium um, that you use. Are you primarily using watercolor, like combined media, gouache? Um, just was curious about that. Yeah, the paintings I was showing are um, watercolor and um, almost always have some colored pencil in them. Um, I like that sometimes for details and like for the texture of it on the watercolor paper. Um, and then sometimes they'll have a little bit of acrylic paint on them too, or gouache, but um, it's like probably 80 or 90% like watercolor. And I love other types of painting and drawing too, but I just think that's my favorite. And it's kind of the medium where I feel like I have like found my voice as an artist more than others, just because I've practiced it the most, I think. Yeah, beautiful work. I mean, watercolor is, can be really, a challenging medium and I feel like you have um, created some amazing detail with with that watercolor medium so thank you for sharing thank that thank you other well I just want to say thank you so much to Jill this was really a super presentation and so interesting and you're very talented and we love your art so thank you so much. Yes, thank you so thank much, you. Jill, for joining us and sharing your love of learning and just reminding us how much of a creative process that is. Um, I will be in touch and I hope to have you visit some of the schools in Piscataquis Plus also. Awesome. And thanks everybody that. for signing on tonight. This yeah, thank fun. you so much. Before we close, I, I do have a devil's advocate question, and I wanted to save it to the very end um, <laughs> because it is one of those things that people feel a little bit strongly about. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on the theory that climate is actually naturally going through a cycle of warming and cooling. And as a second part to that, what is the effect of the human element? Yeah. Um yeah, I think that, I, well, first off, I wish that like there was a form of earth science taught in our, just taught in schools. And um, I know that's at some schools, but it's not at most, and it definitely wasn't at mine. And I think just having that foundation for people would help them um, 
in understanding that and why it's not, you know, accurate. And so I guess um, one of the main things you can look at when you're looking at graphs like I'm showing is um, the rate of change for climate change, for our, the climate change that people are causing is so different than the natural cycles of climate change. And um, we can kind of directly like pinpoint um, why, you know, we as humans are um, the ones that are causing it. And so um, like one, just, you know, knowing the chemistry of what we're putting out into the atmosphere, it's kind of just like that kind of simple kind of chemistry of, you know, these are the fossil fuels that are out there. We can measure their concentration. We know their concentration through time and how that's differ, how that differs. And then two, I think it's just like kind of a budget, like a kind of like a finance like budget thing where like what you put out into the air is going to be, you know, in the air kind of thing. And so for me, that kind of concept of, um, you know, what we put out from cars, from factories, from pollution, like it just makes sense to me that it's there. And um, we know, you know, what a powerful impact it has. And so um, I guess natural climate cycles, like of course the earth, earth climate has changed like so, so drastically over um, earth history, like think about when the dinosaurs wasn't alive and it was the um, level CO2 in the atmosphere was so much higher than today, but it's not, you know, air that we could breathe. And it was so much warmer. And those kind of patterns have changed a lot um, for a lot of reasons, but um, those um, again are like happening at such a like kind of slow pace as opposed to like that quick kind of increase that we have now. Um, and I, um, I think that wasn't the most like organized answer, but um, I think it's just like it, there's a few like kind of simple reasons, but to kind of understand them, I think it's helpful when people can have a little bit of the background in this. And um, sometimes I have found in trying to talk about this with people that um, sometimes if, if they maybe like don't understand it or don't believe it, you know, are they willing to listen? Because if they're not willing to listen, like there's not really a lot I can do to change, you know, their perspective. Um, one thing I do think is that there's some really great, like just kind of simple YouTube videos explaining it a lot better than I just did. Um, and like have great visuals and things. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was a good, a good way to describe it or not, but I guess that's some thoughts from me. <laughs> No, that, that's fantastic. I think adding that visual representation to show the difference between the natural and the human element would be um, a lot easier to explain to people that difference. Um, I do want to thank you, Jill, for joining us, for sharing your art and sharing your inspiration um, to, to help us create a more sustainable future. And I also want to remind everyone we have one more event for our Earth Week series that's going to be a presentation by Go Labs for Innovative Forest Technology. And that is going to be bright and early tomorrow at 10 a.m. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.